the following organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series. Oh, yeah, this will be a great spot. I'm sure I'll catch some big ones down here. No matter where you live, you probably have dams like this, big or small, somewhere near you. Makes you wonder, what are the functions of those dams? Are they still doing what they were built for? Well, the fact is that thousands of outdated dams across the country no longer generate power and block rivers that once flowed freely to places like the Great Lakes or oceans. And that blocks fish species and disrupts the entire energy transfer in an ecosystem. That's why more and more communities struggle with the challenges of removing outdated and sometimes potentially hazardous dams. So how would you overcome the challenges of removing dams and restoring connectivity of the blocked river? That's what we'll explore today as we discover the dilemma of America's dams and restoring rivers as we head into the outdoors to the Boardman River in Michigan. To better understand the complex challenges of removing dams, especially those around our Great Lakes, we first need a bird's eye view. As we look back in history. So for the last 10 to 14,000 years, the Great Lakes system has been evolving. It was colonized by fishes from refugia at the margin of the retreating glaciers. And that system evolved to balance. And so the food web was evolving, animals were co-evolving, and that energy and nutrient dynamics was optimized. In very pristine or close to pristine ecosystems, mother nature and the ecosystem will find an equilibrium. So when you're talking about the Great Lakes, you're talking about a system that since the end of glaciation, these lakes had been in that state of equilibrium until we opened that door. With the introduction of European settlement in the snap of a finger, everything changed. problems with our Great Lakes ecosystem can really be traced back to our efforts to improve humanity. So back when we opened up the Erie Canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway, not only did we open that up for commerce, but guess what? We opened it up and created a vector. We've also opened the door for a huge number of invasive species. So what are these invasive species? Well, we have a number of them and they all came in during different periods of history. So the big one everybody kind of thinks about is sea lamprey, and that was our earliest. But then you also have things like zebra mussels and quagga mussels, round gobies, Eurasian ruffs, and they all came in during different periods of history. So we've all seen these huge ebbs and flows and massive disruptions in our ecosystem in the Great Lakes. So in the Great Lakes, there's been a dramatic Pontocaspian invasion, and it revolves around dracenid mussels and round gobies. And those, so that those two animals have essentially re-engineered Great Lakes ecosystems and how energy moves through those systems and locked up essentially a lot of the productivity in the Great Lakes in the benthos, which means the bottom of the lake bed, and sort of altered that movement of energy to offshore pelagic waters. So an entire re-engineering of the ecosystem based entirely on invasive species from the Ponto Caspian. Another critical invader that's really been a challenge and was essentially the basis for the formation of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in 1954 was the sea lamprey, Petromyzin marinus, and that animal has been tremendously harmful to our ecosystem. At a time when lake trout, which was a really important part of the food web, the top predator, and also a very important commercial fishery, lake trout populations were depressed. 
due to a number of human-induced changes like logging, habitat alterations, commercial fisheries. At the same time they were down is when sea lamprey invaded the system and it really was the final knockout punch essentially to lake trout. And so sea lamprey have been and continue to be uh, a, a huge threat to our, our resources. I think there's something like 85 different invasive fishes in the Great Lakes Basin now, and it's a remarkable how those invasive fishes have altered 10 to 14,000 years of coevolution of our fish communities. In the past 200 years, humans have dramatically altered our ecosystems and our environments. All of the processes from urbanization, industrialization, agriculture, all of those things work together. And the thing that all of them have in common is water. All of those processes, all of those things that happen, everything ends up in our water. Water is the lifeblood of all of us. It is the mo single most important element on the planet, and it's here. And what we're doing to protect our rivers and the bay that it flows into is the right thing to do. Because water is life, each sick and drop. Water is life, each sick If water is life, and reconnecting rivers is the right thing to do, then we should just do it, right? Eh, not so fast. Stay with us as we discover the conundrum to reconnecting dammed rivers. Don't go away. There's more Into the Outdoors. Find more science smarts at intotheoutdoors.org. And now back, Into the Outdoors. Okay, look, when you remove a dam, you reestablish connectivity. But what happens with connectivity? And what are the rewards versus the risks? As you're about to discover, that's what scientists call a conundrum. Everything is related. When one tugs on the string or the thread of life, you can have ripple effects beyond our imagination. So connectivity is, in essence, the fundamental premise of life itself. And in the case of the Boardman River is ecological connectivity. And without the dams in place, that connectivity is fluid. There's no interruptions to it. So there's movement of fish and nutrients within those fish upstream during their migratory periods. They'll deposit eggs or feces, which are then used as food sources for the ecosystem upstream. And then those same nutrients and wildlife can move back downstream. So that's what we think of when we have strong ecological connectivity in a river system. Well, connectivity is important for a number of reasons. In the context of fish, it's mainly about completing their life cycle in order to reproduce and, and grow as a population. I think you'd be amazed in the amount of resilience that natural organisms can have. We still see thousands of individual fish of numerous different species trying to move up this river and they're impeded by the dam. Fish like to have multiple spawning populations, one in the Great Lakes and one on the rivers. By losing one of those, you lose resilience in the system because you open yourself up to catastrophic loss. The key to restoration of our Great Lakes and Great Lakes fisheries, we think, is restoring that connection between the bays, the lakes, and the rivers. So when you put in dams, you break up that continuous pathway of nutrients and energy movement. So dams or road crossings and culverts can be ways that have stopped connectivity in the past. By removing those, that's one way you can return connection between a tributary and its lake. Or in cases like the Unistreet Dam where you don't want to remove a dam because it provides protection against sea lamprey, then you can do things like fishways that can still maintain some movement of fish upstream, but then you still have the issue of unintentionally passing an invasive species like the sea lamprey. Besides the biological and ecological implications of dam removal, there's a strong societal component. Dams are a part of the community. So people are used to 
being able to fish in the impoundments upstream or are used to the water levels that the way they are. So people are very attached to it and changing that or proposing to remove a dam can bring up a lot of strong feelings for removal or finding some other solution. For my people, the Nation RB, this is, this is a the downside to connectivity is everything is connected and so we have invasive or undesirable fish that also gain access to those same spawning grounds that they use to complete their life cycle. When you reconnect a stream like the one behind me to the Great Lakes, you're potentially dealing with species that weren't necessarily there 150 years ago. I'm talking about invasive species. I'm talking about species that are not native to the Great Lakes. We've got to make sure that even though we want to reconnect the river, that we don't allow those aquatic invasive species to proceed upstream. So we're stuck in this dilemma because we were able to take a river that we've worked so diligently to reconnect and undo much of the negative influences that were done to this river in the past 150, 200 years. But the dilemma comes in where this river is connected to a Great Lake. A Great Lake where we have this invasive species who would love to turn all that river into spawning habitat. And that's where the conundrum of Union Street comes in. So the term we like to use here is the connectivity conundrum. So this is weighing the alternative management options of removing a dam to restore connectivity, but that can have some unintended consequences meaning passage of invasive species or contaminants that were trapped either upstream or prevented from reaching upstream because of the dams were in place. Or you, you want to maintain the genetic stock of a fish population upstream from those that are hatchery raised downstream. So the conundrum becomes, what do we do with Union Street? Ideally with Union Street, we needed to improve fish passage. We also needed to block those sea lamprey. Hmm, think about this. So, if sea lamprey present one of the main conundrums to reconnecting rivers, we need to know more about them. And that's what's next. Uh-oh, did I see one down there? Don't go away, there's more Into the Outdoors. Find more science smarts at intotheoutdoors.org. And now back, Into the Outdoors. Why are sea lampreys such a concern when removing dams and reestablishing connectivity? Let's take a closer and scientific look at this sometimes lethal parasite to discover why. Oh, I think there's another one. When you see sea lamprey in a river in June and you see them on a nest, they use their sucker mouth to pick up rocks, arrange a nest that looks like a horseshoe, and then they attach to those rocks at the upstream end of those nests. And the female attaches to the head and they writhe and that's how they reproduce, to keep the eggs in the nest and to keep themselves in the nest. Their embryos develop in the nest for about two weeks and then they hatch out and they become these very small larvae that are about a half inch. They burrow into the soft muck that you see on the edges of rivers and they live in that soft muck for at least three to seven years. They're blind, they feed on algae. They're really hard to find at that life stage. But once they reach about six inches, they go through a metamorphosis. They develop their eyes, their sucker mouth, their fins. They leave the rivers in the fall and winter. And with their sucker mouth, they go out and start feeding on those fishes. When they die, it's not a one-to-one -one balance in the population. A single female can have up to 100,000 eggs in the Great Lakes. Survival to the metamorphosis can be 10 to 30 percent. So without control and without natural predators, sea lamprey can very quickly infest rivers in the larval stage and then that bleeds out into the lakes where they kill fishes. People may think lamprey are harmless when they're spawning in a river, but when they're out in the Great Lakes, they're feeding on fishes that are valuable for the ecosystem and valuable for people. A single lamprey, to get to the size where it's spawning, likely destroys up to 40 pounds of fish uh, in its single life. Multiply that times tens of thousands of lamprey, you have more dead fish caused by lamprey than more fish that are caught by commercial and recreational fisheries combined. 
throughout their range, sea lampreys and lampreys in general are hugely valuable from an ecological perspective. It's when they're invasive that they become a problem. Sea lamprey are native to the Atlantic and there they serve a valuable ecosystem function. They play a key role in the environment and the food web and they co-evolved with their hosts. So they have very large hosts. They don't tend to kill their hosts. They don't really cause a problem. But in the Great Lakes, for example, where they invaded, they didn't co-evolve with their hosts. Their hosts are smaller and they're much more susceptible. So that predator-prey relationship didn't evolve through time. And so they're particularly problematic. People may wonder if it's a parasite or a predator. In its native habitat, which is in the North Atlantic, it's a parasite. A lamprey this big attaches to a fish that's as big as your car. It parasitizes that fish and the fish is generally able to recover. In the Great Lakes, you have a lamprey this big attaching to a fish this big. In that circumstance, lamprey become predators and can destroy up to 40 pounds of fish. In that 12 to 18 months, they're out in the lakes feeding on those fish. So sea lamprey are just like any other fish or critter out there. They're just trying to survive, they're trying to make it. It just so happens that sea lamprey have a much creepier way of making their way through life. If you're looking for a key villain in a bee horror movie, the sea lamprey is what you're after. Um, sea lamprey are kind of the vampires of the Great Lakes, if you will. They have this kind of creepy looking buccal cavity with all these teeth in it, the sucking mouth part. They attach and inside that mouth is a rasping tongue that has teeth on there that they use almost as a drill, hitting over and over on the fish until it bores a hole in. They also release an anticoagulant that keeps the blood and bodily fluids flowing. A single lamprey can consume up to 10 to 20% of its body weight in blood in a single day. So it may only take one or two days for a large lake trout to die from a lamprey attack. So here's an analogy. Imagine this for a moment. So you're a human, you're going through your day-to-day -day life, hey there, what's and happening? all of a sudden you have this 25-pound critter Ooh, with this huge suction buccal cavity filled with sharp teeth, and it attaches to your neck. <laughs> and so as you go through your day-to-day -day life, this thing Owie. is literally ow, 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 sucking ow, ow. the bodily fluids out of you, <sighs> sucking the life out of you. That's the life of a Great Lakes fish. That's the life of a lake trout or a Chinook salmon or a steelhead. Although lake trout are uh, the key prime species for lamprey attack, there's a lot of other fishes on the list. Uh, there's Chinook salmon, Atlantic salmon, there's coho salmon. They feed on walleye, they feed on lake sturgeon, they feed on suckers, they feed on whitefish, they feed on ciscos. The list can go on and on. We've seen lamprey on almost every fish in the Great Lakes. But as far as I know, there's been no known feeding on humans, so it doesn't pose any threat to humans. Oh, yuck. I wouldn't want one of those things attached on my neck. As you can see, managing them are a part of managing fisheries. And as you're about to see, managing fisheries is a balancing act between science and society. Don't go away. There's more Into the Outdoors. Find more science smarts at IntoTheOutdoors.org. And now back, Into the Outdoors. So how would you solve the connectivity conundrum? Well, if you're part of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, you might use a combination of science, partnerships, and thinking outside the box, or the fish ladder in this case. Let's explore what makes Fish Pass unique. Structurally, we're replacing the Union Street Dam. We're constructing a brand new dam here, but physically, it's, it's a lot more than that. Fish Pass, it's adaptive. Most fishways are hardscaped concrete and are unchangeable. So if they don't work on day one at passing your desirable fish or blocking your undesirable fish, there's no way to change it. Whereas Fish Pass is meant with that optimization and adaptability in mind. So we can try out a number of different technologies and techniques to be able to selectively pass desirable fish while still blocking and or removing those undesirable fish. If you boil the question down, the question becomes, how do you sort a mixed assemblage of fishes moving into our rivers to spawn? 
we drew some inspiration from the recycling industry, which is essentially the same thing in single stream recycling. They had to come up with solutions to the question of how do you sort this mixed assemblage of materials. And so they drew on technologies that targeted specific attributes of this mixed recyclable stream. So we will sort these animals as they move into the system based on their specific attributes. People kind of get that analogy when we're talking about fish pass. This is science that's being done nowhere else on the planet, and it deals with one of the biggest fishery management challenges that we face. How do you get good things past dams, and there are hundreds of thousands of them around the world, and how do you block bad things that harm your fishery like sea lamprey? So this is a world-class research project that's going on right here that is able to work with fish that are naturally running in a river and have a site that's fully adaptable and of a size that's comparable to passage scenarios in a lot of tributaries. But then most of all, the biggest objective is being able to export that process to other tributaries around the Great Lakes and throughout the world. What we don't want to do is convey the message that this is the solution to the problem everywhere because each system differs based on their hydrology, their geology, their setting, whether they're urban or rural. And so what we really want to export here is the approach to the problem. That's the key. Besides the benefits to the fish population, the city also benefits with a brand new structure that provides a nice, safe, unique facility to convey floodwaters and also park space that the people can use on a daily basis and also learn something because we have it tied in strongly with the science that's going on. So to convey that science that's going on at Fish Pass, we are establishing an education and outreach program so we can have classrooms that come in, we'll have space dedicated to be able to host tours and classrooms to be able to learn about Fish Pass and connectivity in general. People are going to see cutting edge science every day. That excites people. And we have every intention of optimizing that opportunity by bringing more people in, bringing school groups, so that youth can see various opportunities for them to be involved in science. And, oh, by the way, you can do something good for the environment and you can do something for those neat fish. It's a winner. It will spawn the next generation of, of people interested in the environment. We've been woefully deficient in educating people on the importance of the freshwater resource we have. And I think Fish Pass will help them understand that it's not just Lake Michigan and Grand Traverse Bay, but it's an entire watershed that extends miles inland and alive with other species that are meant to be there. We have federal agencies providing the funding to design and build this structure. We have tribal governments that have a right in the resource, and that resource includes the fisheries that use this river and the Great Lakes. And then we have a state agency that is technically responsible for managing those fisheries. And then we have a, a local community that will actually own the structure. This really is not only a blueprint, for relationships, but it's really the standard, in my opinion, of what relationships can result in. This project simply wouldn't happen if we didn't have all the people and all the parties involved working together as we do. I've been involved in a lot of projects over the years, never anything like this. I bet next time you see a dam, big or small, you'll consider the risks and potential rewards of removing that dam and re-establishing connectivity. You might also think about how today's science and innovation are opening new possibilities for solving America's and the world's connectivity conundrum. See you next time on Into the Outdoors. organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series.